unless I knew. <laughs> I'm still very confused. I think we need to think about uh, the purpose of the data. Who really is the target? Because again, these numbers are out there in English. Okay, I can speak Japanese well enough um, to be the same as Sean is a functionally illiterate in this country at this point. Uh, but you know, again, somebody from abroad who isn't going to be able to really understand what these numbers mean, okay? Particularly when you go to a Japanese source and they don't quite match what you're seeing in English, that even lends to more confusion, okay? So this is another problem. Who is this data really for? Who is the target? Um, I think that what we need, hopefully, we can arrive to at some point, the, uh, the need for honestly reported, clearly defined and transparent data, uh, if, if possible. And, you know, this, this speaks to a larger issue that I've come to, to find out more about as I've worked in international education, international education in Japan here. Um, there's not a lot of cooperation between Japanese universities, which I find personally kind of frustrating and, and, and very much um, a detriment to the overall health of international education in Japan. I mean, I think the international, well, I studied abroad uh, as a student. I was looking for a country where I could speak English. I studied in Amsterdam. I studied in Amsterdam. Um, I know all of that. Uh, but uh, at any rate, um, you know, it's, it's outside experiences as well that are very important. Um, but the thing is, you know, I often get emails or I often talk to people and they say, well, what about your program? And I say, well, no, you know, we really don't fit. But I know of this program here and here. And I actually give them other options. And I just wonder, does that ever happen at other universities? Are they really willing to share? these students because again it's the overall it's the country for an undergraduate it's really the country that matters right as a graduate student yes you probably want to go to a waseda you want to go to a todai as a grad student for the most part for the most part as an undergraduate you want to be in the country and it doesn't matter if you're in hokkaido in beppu in tokyo you just want to be in japan and i think there needs to be a greater understanding of the network okay and the challenge that japan faces you know as a study abroad destination overall you know, we're, we're being passed over by China, okay? Uh, people want to go to China instead of Japan. And, and we, Japanese educators, are saying, wait a second, why are you jumping over us? But I think a lot of it has to do with we just don't talk to each other enough and promote the country versus our own uh, interests in that. And I think we, have to, we really have to come to a, a pass that at some point. Um, another point is that if it's problematic to categorize incoming students, then what about the Japanese students going abroad? Right? I, think, I think we really need to look at, you know, the, there's a number of stories that have come out in the last two or three years, you know, the myth of the reluctant study abroad, disinterested Japanese student, you know. I really feel that at best it's under-examined and at, ver at worst it's, it's exaggerated, okay. Uh, and I say that because in the last two years, you know, we, we do an incoming student orientation. Um, I finally got on the ball and I started doing a survey uh, for our students. Uh, two years ago we had uh, 300 students that attended. These are incoming freshmen uh, at my university. And again, we only send out about 10 or 15 students. Now, 300 incoming students. My, my goal would be every single one of those students should be able to study abroad okay, by the end of their four-year career. This year, we had 500 students that came. Okay, in an era where the media is reporting it as that Japanese students are not interested in studying abroad. Okay. So again, we've got a disconnect. And, and that's why, as an international educator, we have to be stronger advocates. We've got to get our own message out to sort of compete against that which is picked up uh, and nitpicked over, okay, and not really fully understanding the true scope of international education in Japan. Um, a quote I love is, is by uh, Dr. John Hudson. Uh, you don't know him either, <laughs> uh, but he's from Michigan State University. He's a professor of economics. He was the uh, former president of NAFSA. NAFSA is a large uh, international education association. Okay, it's a, it's a U.S.-based, been uh, holding international conferences for 60 years. Okay, that all U.S. institutions are members, uh, members from around the world. Okay, so you know, in international education, he was pretty big, pretty big dude in some ways, right? Um, but he continues to point out that study abroad is a growth industry. We have to realize that. I, can't recall what he's talking about in terms of how many students students are going to be moving over the next 10 to 15 years. But it's it's a substantial increase, and we have to understand that. So there isn't this shrinkingness. Okay, there is an interest to move around, and we are in that era of trading talent. Right? We 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 moved from 
industrial products, right? We moved from financial services. We're in the talent industry now, or you know, the talent trading, okay, in some ways. Students need to have these global experiences, and we are in a growth industry, so that's, that's very encouraging. And, and that's the final point of, of that data, is that students are moving, and I would say, let's not, let's not lose sight of the individual. That takes me uh, into what I hope is, is uh, less than uh, problematic in terms of processing at this point. Um, you know, influences on intimacy and isolation. Now, in my experience, I, I wear a number of hats, so to speak, okay? Uh, I'm not a trained counselor. Uh, I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I play one in the study of broad world. Um, that's part of the job. Um, but, you know, I, I think I do have some things to offer that others don't. I, you know, lived in Japan now for 20 years. I've studied abroad myself. I think that student coming in feels a little bit more relaxed talking to me about a range of problems and issues than they would uh, a Japanese person. They don't want to come in and complain about the country to a Japanese person. They'd rather come in and complain about it to somebody who also has stories to tell them uh, how he complains about the country too. So, you know. Uh, so, you know, and also the fact that, you know, you, you probably do want someone in, in your native language. You know, when you're getting into really deep personal issues, which I've gotten into uh, over these last six years. Um, now, personally, myself, after living here for 12 years, um, I've been in counseling. I've had to do that for my own mental health, okay? Uh, and I sought out an individual who has a license here in Japan as well as the UK. He's lived in Japan for 20 years. He speaks fluent British, <laughs> okay? Uh, because I tried a Japanese counselor first, and there just was not a connection there. You know, there just was, he had also spent time abroad, but there just was something missing there. So I think at my university, we uh, finally hired uh, someone who can speak fluent uh, English, but she also is Japanese. I hope students will warm up to her. She's a great person. She's a great resource for my university. But I think for the first stop, for the first year, I tend to be that person. And so what I decided to do uh, during orientation over the last two years is uh, I bring the students in on a Saturday when nobody else is around. We do our culture shock and intercultural communication, intercultural competence uh, kind of a, uh, informational session. But before we do that, uh, what I'll do is I'll give them a blank piece of paper and say, okay, you've got two hours to find a quiet spot on our campus and just write how you're feeling. Okay, so what you're going to be seeing now are reflections from students uh, during their first week of being in Japan. And I've, I've started to follow that up various times during the year. I did it this year, uh, last December. I did it in April when some of the students came back after the earthquake. And I'll do it again in July because I, I really want them to understand this process that they're going through. It's not just about the academics. Again, they're not going to really remember the, you know, the, the, the stuff that I told them on soft power in my Japanese diplomacy course, right? Uh, they remember that we took, we went to the Japanese diet, we met a politician, we went to a great Chinese restaurant afterwards, we had a good time. That's what they're going to remember. I hope they remember some about soft power, but uh, <laughs> probably not much, probably not much, right? And so, you know, in terms of, you know, what are some of the influences on intimacy and isolation? For my university, right, we're talking about the location. And one, one student, I feel trapped by the city at the sheer amount of people compressed into one space. Tokyo is not the land of Hello Kitty. It is the concrete mass of endless noise, okay? Um, our campus culture also uh, influences. And our students, I think, you know, our culture is very conservative. It's very deliberate. It's, it's, it's filtered internationalism in many respects. Uh, our student interests and their capabilities. One student described our students as not well-traveled in one of his essays, okay? In terms of the program, the, the influences, you know, our accommodations, where we have our accommodations, okay, the style and, and location, the academics, balancing English and Japanese, okay, and the friendships uh, that they try to make as well also influence the intimacy. And then for the students, this idea of the perception, okay, the initial reaction, simple accomplishments, past experiences, and keeping connections, okay, very much influence their association with intimacy and isolation. And so what do we have? Like, for example, initial reactions. The first night not only blew my mind away, but it was the first time that I was hysterically crying all night from exhaustion and being completely overwhelmed. Another student wrote, the last few days have been really interesting for me. It was the first time in Japan. Everything is so new. 
I read some articles, I read some articles and books about this land and its people, but to be here and to see it on my own is not the same. At the first, at the first night I thought, wow, the sound of the insects in anime is not exaggerated. Okay, so a different, you know, initial perception of, the, of, of these two individuals. One being top uh, individuals from the United States, not that, that really matters, both of them are female. Uh, the bottom was from France, okay. In terms of simple accomplishments, right, the last day of orientation definitely feels better being here than the first. I can find my way back from the station and buy a donut, okay. And it's very simple things that they want to be able to find when they come here, okay, to sort of, you know, offset that isolation that they might feel. Um, another person expressing the frustration of not even being able to do his laundry. He can't read the instructions, okay, feeling like a helpless child, okay. Those are some thoughts on that. Um, in terms of past experiences, right? Okay, um, you know, the problem is, you know, students, students can leave a lot of things that they own back home, right? But they can't leave their past when they come on the study abroad experience, right? That comes with you, okay? And we all know how that feels when you get into an unfamiliar environment, how that gets stirred up, right? And so, um, just a, a few, uh, you know, I almost did what I tend to do at home and found an overgrown spot in the trees to hide. Decided as soon as I got there that if I did that, I would maintain a bad habit, so I went out exploring. I like getting lost, trying to find my way back to somewhere that I know. Okay, so again, you know, what she was doing, this is student from the UK, uh, she didn't want to fall into that trap in Japan because I think she knew she could head down a very difficult, very difficult road. Uh, since I arrived here, I haven't been, quote, too happy. I haven't found it great to be here, nor am I sad or depressed for that matter. It feels just normal. However, I have been feeling that nothingness since maybe two, three, or six months. I can't remember well. I don't think it is linked to Japan. Uh, a little bit of background on this particular student, um, also from France. She's a graduate student that we have in our program. Um, earlier, uh, well, last year now, um, she had a friend who died. Uh, from complications from surgery. In the previous year, uh, she had a friend for whom she had affection commit suicide. Okay, so she's dealing with some very, very heavy issues. Okay, she wrote about that in the essay, which I was very help, you know, thankful for because that again helps me to know, you know, maybe I need to not not become that you know father figure or meddling in the sense, but at least I can you know cue on that and understand that maybe if she's not showing up or if you know things are getting a little heavy, I kind of know where that's coming from. So again, it's, it's been very valuable for me personally to, to see these students write so honestly and openly so soon into their program. Okay, Again, they all know it's anonymous, but come on, we have a small program. <laughs> you know, uh, I can sort of tell the, the, you know, the, I've read enough essays so I know who is a, you know, a proficient speaker of English. I don't like the native speaker of English stuff, but the proficient speaker of English versus sort of a non-proficient speaker. So, I, and, and when she threw in a couple of French words, I sort of knew, you know, where that came from, right? Uh, and the last one, uh, you know, coming um, from a, a, a guy from the UK. The truth of the matter is, I feel extremely homesick. I feel that bouts of depression, once defeated, have once again reared their ugly heads. In the last seven nights, I have totaled yet a measly sum of ten hours of sleep. I feel guilt, guilt at the abandonment of loved ones, selfishness of decisions made. Happiness is not what it once was. It becomes the polluted, bastardized child of true joy. Okay, but he concluded by saying, hopefully everything will be all right. I wanted to write that because if anything happens, maybe I would need to talk. Okay, this was the same student who once, when he came into my office, had said, uh, I have trouble with three things, um, time, sleep, and death. Where do you begin when someone comes into your office and, and, and mentions that? Okay. Um, just quickly, on, on friendship.